concludes topical questions. We'll turn now to our next item of business, which is a statement by Aileen Campbell on the interim findings of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights on UK Poverty. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Aileen Campbell. Now, I apologise there. Just uh, over a week ago, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Philip Alston, issued interim findings from his 12-day visit to the UK. And he did not pull any punches in his devastating critique of the UK government's deeply flawed approach to welfare reform and the damaging, uh, damage being done to the wider social safety net. Professor Alston's report is a damning indictment of the systemic failings of the UK government, which has overseen the first sustained rises in poverty in recent years. Sustained rises which threaten to engulf almost four in every 10 children in Scotland by 2030. He described this pros prospect as not just a disgrace, but as a social calamity and an economic disaster all rolled into one. And I agree with that assessment. His message is clear. In a country as wealthy and prosperous as the UK, current levels of poverty and deprivation are already <coughs> completely unacceptable. Further projected increases would be an attack on the very fabric of our society. The rapporteur sets out very clearly that welfare changes have been a political choice, not a necessity. As he points out, the UK government could have made the choice to end austerity in its recent budget. And here I quote, Resources were available to the Treasury at the last budget that could have transformed the situation of millions of people living in poverty, but the political choice was made to find tax cuts for the wealthy instead. The Resolution Foundation has outlined that the £2.8 billion to be spent uh, next year on tax cuts will disproportionately benefit high earners. For almost half this cost, £1.5 billion, the UK government could have ended the benefit freeze instead. In Scotland alone, the four-year benefit freeze has led to the biggest reduction in spending, around £190 million pounds in 2018-19 and around £370 million per year by 2020-21, impacting on 930,000 children. Professor Alston stated, the Department for Work and Pensions is more concerned with making economic savings and sending messages about lifestyles than responding to the multiple needs of those living with a disability, job loss, housing insecurity, illness and the demands of parenting. And he also points out the supposed savings that were to have been delivered have actually just been transferred to other public services. The costs of austerity have fallen disproportionately upon people in poverty, women, minority ethnic communities, children, lone parents and disabled people. He speaks of the gendered nature of the cuts imposed and their detrimental impacts on children. The rapporteur calls for regressive policies such as the benefit cap and the two-child limit with its abhorrent rape clause to be reversed. And I hope his remarks will add weight to the repeated asks made by Scottish ministers and many others for exactly the same changes. Professor Austin's findings also add weight to the evidence that there are fundamental flaws at the heart of universal credit. These defects have been well aired in this chamber, so I will not repeat them all, but I do want to pick up on one. The first initial problem that people face with universal credit, which is, is the inbuilt minimum five week wait for payment, which for some can be much longer. Advanced payments intended to bridge that gap are then required to be paid back at a rate that substantially reduces household income. This is austerity by design, pushing people into debt, rent arrears and to emergency funding and food banks at the very start of receiving a benefit. And again, the human cost is on people's health and well-being. No one should be going hungry because they can't afford to eat or be anxious because they need to borrow money to put the heat on or worry about being made homeless because endless delays mean that their rent may not be paid. Professor Alston's findings are the latest in a long line of reports evidencing the damage of universal credit is inflicting on people and the communities in which they live. When the rapporteur, the National Audit Office, the Work and Pensions Committee, devolved governments and countless charities and other stakeholders keep telling youth the same thing, then you must listen. 
Now, we welcome the new Secretary of State for Work and Pensions comments that she wants to deliver a fair, compassionate and efficient benefits system. But warm words are not enough. Change is needed to end austerity and to make universal credit fit for purpose. As the rapporteur pointed out, these are political choices which can be reversed easily. Amber Rudd must also take heed and take the decision her predecessors failed to. She must stop universal credit now and fix the problems. To do otherwise and ignore these repeated warnings is to risk condemning a generation of children and their families to a lifetime of poverty that they will struggle to rise out of. And, presiding officer, this is before we even start to consider the unknown impacts of Brexit. The rapporteur highlights that those on low incomes appear to be an afterthought and that no consideration has been given as to what will happen to poverty levels following departure from the EU. And I would say this is one of many impacts the UK government has given no consideration to. And we've called on the UK government to publish an impact assessment setting out the impacts of various Brexit scenarios on poverty. It is essential, though, that the UK government has a fully formed plan for potential futures it is considering. It must set out robust action to ensure that those on low incomes are fully protected against the negative impacts that will be delivered by any form of Brexit, in particular the disaster of a no deal. So let me turn now to Professor Alston's findings regarding Scotland. As part of his visit, the rapporteur spent two days in Scotland to meet with ministers, including the First Minister and myself, eh, the key Scottish Government officials, organisations representing a wide range of interests, as well as children and disabled people. And I welcome the rapporteur's recognition of the fundamentally different approach Scotland has taken to poverty, social security and, of course, human rights. And we have much to be proud of. We have established a new social security agency with dignity, fairness and respect at its heart and have already delivered a valuable top-up to a carer's allowance and will commence the first enhanced Best Start grant payments before Christmas this year. We have launched Fair Start Scotland, a dignified approach to employability support which does not rule by fear of crippling sanctions backed up by up to £20 million each year on top of the levels of funding provided by the UK Government. Our Scottish Welfare Fund provides much-needed support for individuals in crisis, backed by £38 million of investment each year, funding which is not provided across England. And in 2018-19, we are spending over £125 million, £20 million more than last year, on welfare mitigation and supporting those on low incomes. But I would prefer to be investing this money to pull out people from poverty. We can only mitigate against the worst of the cuts because welfare spending in Scotland is expected to have reduced by £3.7 billion in 2021 as a result of the UK government welfare reforms since 2010. And frankly, the fact that we have to spend any of our resources to protect against another government's policies is, as the rapporteur, rapporteur rightly said, outrageous. He also notes that mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. And the price of mitigating this full cut for this year alone would be the equivalent to three times our annual police budget or the entire annual budget of both NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and NHS Lothian. So in closing, presiding officer, as the special rapporteur has made clear, austerity and welfare cuts are not a necessity. They are a political choice. And in Scotland, we are making a different choice. As a parliament, we have united in saying that current levels of child poverty are unacceptable and that we will take the radical action needed to change the fortunes of the 230,000 children in poverty today and the generations of children to come. Radical action which starts with our first tackling child poverty delivering plan. And this outlines the range of actions we will take to lift children out of poverty, including working towards introducing a new income supplement, investing in intensive key worker support to help parents enter and progress in the labour market, and our significant investment in early learning and childcare right across Scotland. Through these and the wide range of other actions, we are using the powers of this parliament to demonstrate to those in Westminster that there is another way forward, one which puts fairness, equality and human dignity at the centre of our approach. And we're doing this not solely because it makes economic sense to do so, we do it because it is the right thing to do. And I would ask parties across the chamber to unite to call on Westminster to make the changes necessary or to devolve the powers in order to allow us to make these changes for ourselves. When Theresa May became Prime Minister, she spoke of the urgent need to tackle the burning injustices of the UK as a top priority. 
The rapporteur's report shows that it's high time for her to now start to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Elaine Smith. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Professor Alston also notes that while Scotland has the lowest poverty rate in the UK, and in part that's because it benefits from the highest amount spent on public services per capita, Scotland also has the lowest life expectancy and the highest suicide rate in the, great, in the whole of Great Britain. Now, both health and mental health are devolved matters. So will the minister also recognise that when it comes to poverty, her government has to take responsibility for their record on these issues and address some of these issues at source? Cabinet Secretary. While I have responsibility for the policies around tackling uh, poverty, it's absolutely the commitment and priority of this whole government to do what it can with the powers that we have to help improve the life chances of everybody. And of course, we have some public health challenges and those were articulated within uh, the document. And this government has taken the actions necessary to help ensure people can have uh, a life uh, and enhanced uh, a sense of well-being and to reverse some of those challenges that we have. But the finger of blame points fairly and squarely at the UK government for the systemic cuts that they have made to social security and welfare reforms and the continued political, ideologically driven austerity that the Professor Alston has said could be reversed easily if they took the decision to do, to, do so. The UK government has a choice of two futures. They can continue to give tax benefits as they have done to the wealthiest or they could change tack and they could gift a better future to people of Scotland across the UK. Thus far, they have failed, singularly failed to do so. And that seems to me that the politically, ideologically driven motivation behind these welfare reforms is going to be something very difficult for this parliament to shift. And to do so, we we'll need to make sure that we have the powers here, or at least make sure that we can uh, press hard for the UK government to change tact. And Ms. Michelle Ballantyne's shaking her head. She should do well to go and make the same passionate representations to her colleague down at Westminster. <laughs> Can I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Alison Johnson? Thank you. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of the statement? It really is shocking that the UK has had such a damning UN poverty report, which completely exposes the Tory approach to welfare as an ideologically driven political choice with austerity disproportionately impacting on women, children, minority ethnic communities, disabled people and those living in poverty. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that in his press conference, Professor Alston said of universal credit that it is a system that could have been designed by a group of misogynists, a system, as members know, that is driving the normalisation of food, baby and toy banks, the kind of charity that should not be the norm in a rich country. Instead, families should have increased household income. And whilst the report credits the Scottish Government for mitigating some of the effects of Tory welfare policy, it is not enough today to just attack the Tory Government. So will the Cabinet Secretary now take immediate action to lift 30,000 children out of poverty by implementing the £5 child benefit top-up, by rolling out North Lanarkshire Council's Club 365 scheme across Scotland as recommended by the Poverty and Inequality Commission, and use their powers to reverse the abhorrent to a child policy. Scotland's children in need cannot wait any longer for radical action. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I did see that the uh, Professor Alston had very uh, d uh, damning uh, things to say about the gendered nature of the security, uh, social security cuts and the uh, austerity measures that the UK government uh, have taken forward. And of course, uh, the uh, rape clause and the two-child cap uh, are, personifies and epitomises that gendered nature of their approach and it's something that I think uh, Elaine Smith, myself uh, and across to all of our benches we would uh, agree on that needs to, needs to stop. However, I would just point out that it, I think that sometimes the way in which uh, she has articulated her question to me suggests that we are doing nothing, that we're sitting idly by and just letting this happen because we are not. We're taking concerted efforts in the here and now to protect uh, the people of Scotland as best we can. That includes £125 million spent on mitigation, mopping up the UK government's mess through their uh, failed policies. It includes the Child Poverty uh, Action Plan, the, the actions that we've set out back with £50 million to try and help uh, uh, children across the country. It includes the £3.5 million that we're spending on food, uh, dignified responses to food insecurity. It includes the work that Shirley Ann Somerville has taken forward around the establishment of a new social security agency here based on dignity, fairness and respect.
respect. And that doesn't just mean that that's the totality of our work. We're looking to take forward the income supplement to lift children out of poverty, just in the way that uh, Elaine Smith described uh, through the, the campaigns that had uh, led up to that announcement. And we'll continue to work in a cross-party, reasonable sense around how we make that happen. But we are doing a lot of work in the here and now, mopping up another government's mess. But surely, if we had the powers here in this parliament, then we could do a lot more to help the people of Scotland. <laughs> Alison Johnson to be followed by Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Professor Alston said that the local preparations he saw for universal credit, a UK government welfare reform, resembled, and I quote, the sort of activity one might expect for an impending natural disaster or health epidemic. And of course, what we've seen is only the tip of the iceberg because the major challenge will be when the bulk of people on existing legacy benefits are transferred from next year. Can I ask what additional steps the Scottish Government are taking to help local authorities, the third sector and communities prepare for the final managed migration stage off the rollout, given the UK Government's refusal to halt it, despite ever-increasing evidence of the damage caused by its many flaws? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, and I know that the, the, the points that have been raised by Alison Johnson are, are clean, cleanly heard by my colleague uh, Shirley Ann uh, Summerfield, who has regular engagement with the UK government, and certainly on the points that she's raised, that this is something that has been pressed to Amber Rudd to make sure that she does listen uh, to those recommendations. Of course, we have regular engagement with uh, local authorities, with COSLA, across a range of different ministerial portfolios to ensure that they do feel the support that is there that is necessary in order for them to cope with that managed migration. And also we do continue to work with the third sector uh, organisations who so often have the agility there to respond to the need of people who are facing uh, destitution or poverty uh, as well. We'll continue to work with uh, both COSLA and the third sector uh, and others wherever we need to, to ensure that they can uh, feel supported as they themselves provide the support to the people across the country. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Angela Constance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for early sight of this statement. Professor Alston also said of Brexit that anyone concerned with poverty in the UK had reason to be very deeply concerned. Given that many people who are reliant on the social, uh, social security and the welfare state may have voted leave on the understanding that that would increase co uh, money coming into the Exchequer and that certainly nobody voted to become poorer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with my party that those people should be offered the chance to revisit their decision in the form of a people's vote. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I think I agree with uh, Alec Cole Hamilton when he said that nobody voted to become poorer during the uh, EU referendum to exit uh, the EU. Absolutely nobody voted to become poorer. And indeed, I think it did call into question some of the, the, uh, the promises that were made uh, in the whole uh, course of that referendum. Uh, but certainly what I would remind Alec Cole Hamilton is that the people in Scotland voted to stay in the European Union. And certainly the First Minister has been very clear around the, uh, the fact that she's never ruled out and certainly would not uh, stand in the way of a people's vote. But certainly uh, I think what we need to do given the impact of Brexit on those most vulnerable across the country is to continue to work hard to do whatever we need to plan, to support local authorities, to support uh, third sector in the way that Alison Johnson asked us to do to make sure that we are fully prepared for the impact of Brexit because it is those people, those most vulnerable people, those that are going to be hit hardest, the ones that don't have the financial resilience or the security that stand to lose most. And again, I would just point out that the UK government has a lot, uh, a lot to... Uh, to be considering as well as they progress Brexit in the shambolic way that they're taking it forward. And they need to think very hard about Professor Alston's report, but also the impact of Brexit that they are, are taking forward, which will tend, I think, to consign a lot more people to a lot more heartache over the years to come. Angela Constance to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the UN Rapporteur when he said that it is patently unjust and contrary to British values that so many people are living in poverty in the UK and that British compassion has been outsourced and replaced by punitive, mean-spirited and callous approaches to tackling poverty. Cabinet Secretary. Well, certainly the values that this government and the, what we are focusing on are the values written into our Social Security Act, Act of dignity, fairness and respect. And none of those values can be easily found in much of what the UK government has attempted to do through welfare reforms, austerity 
and social security cuts. And with the rapporteur himself describing cuts as draconian and sanctions as cruel and inhumane, it seems as though he agrees with that departure from those uh, key uh, values of uh, fairness, respect and dignity. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary agrees with the special rapporteur uh, when he said of devolved uh, welfare powers, it's clear to me that there is still a real accountability gap which should be addressed. The absence of a legal remedy or a more robust reference to international standards in the Social Security Scotland Act is significant and should be addressed. What does she plan to do about that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the whole point and purpose of the Social Security Act, the whole premise by which it has been created is to firmly have within its heart human rights and certainly within the, the social security charter has a direct accountability to parliament as well and again in, in relation to the answers I think I gave to Patrick Harvey last week of course we'll take on board what the rapporteur says but certainly everything that we do and continue to do the policies across the whole of government has human rights uh, at its heart and as written in uh, within the very uh, foundations of the social security act again we'll take on board the rapporteur's comments but I think he should be looking a wee bit closer to home to his own party to see whether or not human rights are certainly not part of the, hum the UK government's approach. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that today, despite the UK being the fifth richest country in the world, that as many as 14 million people live in poverty, including as many as 4 million children? Is she also aware that under the Tories' watch, 600,000 more children have fallen into relative poverty? Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this is the biggest failure in public policy this century, which according to the UN is a result of massive cuts to social security and misguided reforms to welfare payments. Presiding officer, it's noticeable that the Tories are not even prepared to stand up in this chamber today to defend their own government. That shows you the utter shameful position of the UK government. Cabinet Secretary. Bruce Crawford talked there around 600,000 more children falling into relative poverty eh, as a result of, of the UK government's eh, policies. I think, presiding officer, that's 600,000 reasons to do something different, to take a different path and to try and reverse those cuts that the UK government have inflicted upon so many. It is an absolute disgrace that UK government policies are driving the first sustained rise in poverty levels in recent years. That's why we're taking a different approach, a different tact in this government. That's why our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, lay the blame for rising child poverty levels firmly at the do door of the UK Government. Uh, and that is why, though, we will continue to take the actions we need to reverse, as best we can, uh, the, the cuts that the UK Government are taking, but also to protect the most vulnerable, to lift children out of poverty, to take forward the policies that we know will work, and to make sure that we can give the children in this country a better future. Mark Griffin to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, President Officer. I'm once again grateful that the Cabinet Secretary has said the Government will use its powers to create a new benefit and is working towards a new income supplement. With thousands of children being caught by the welfare reforms now, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the June report will not only confirm the budget for the income supplement, the value of the income supplement, but also the Timmy's introduction in the next financial year? Secretary. Well, we're taking forward work on the income supplement to develop it in a way that ensures that we can have the maximum reach and to support the, the, the most uh, children that we possibly can in order to uh, lift children and families out of poverty. And certainly we'll continue to keep the, the member informed of the progress that has been made. We're continuing to work with organisations like the Child, uh, Child Poverty Action Group, uh, Poverty Alliance Scotland and others to make sure that we get this right. It is complex work that we're taking forward, but we're committed to that work and we're committed to the success we know it will deliver and the impact it will have for people and families across the country. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the UN, rap UN Rapporteur's assessment of UK government policy that if you got a group of misogynists together in a room and said, how can we make a system that works for men but not women, they wouldn't have come up with too many more ideas than what's already in place? And does she agree with me that by embedding equalities and human rights assessments into decision-making, the Scottish Government can and will do better for women? 
Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, I do agree with uh, Ruth Maguire's assessment and uh, with assessment of the UN rapporteur around UK government policy, which is having a disproportionate impact on women across the UK. Uh, and that's why if we had the powers here, we wouldn't have measures like the two child limit or the appalling rape clause that goes uh, with it. We, I, I hear um, uh, sedentary comments coming from the other side. You know, the, the, the Labour Party need to stop weaponising this policy. We want to work together in order to make the difference to women's lives across the country. And again, I would underline the fact that we are doing what we can with the powers we have. The Social Security Scotland, we're bringing forward the Best Start grant, which will launch and will improve the financial support available to low-income mothers. And won't just be on the birth of the first or second child, which will, we will not have a cap on the number of children it will, it will help. And we'll continue to ensure that human rights and equality are embedded with the policy approaches we take, not just in my portfolio, but right across the country, because that's when we get better decisions. It's when we're able to help women across the country. Country. Annie Wells to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you. It's noted in Professor Olson's report that in Glasgow only 3% of local welfare fund applications were decided in a day as compared with 99% elsewhere. Will the Cabinet Secretary promise a review into why there is such disparity? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> I think um, to, I think uh, Glasgow have a, a different assessment of that, but certainly from our perspective, we'll happily look into that and ensure that we can see where the, the, the truth is and how we can make some of the uh, changes or improvements that are necessary. Bob Doris to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, the UN Special Rapporteur slams success of UK government stating they have presided over the systematic dismantling of the social security safety net. And it adds that universal credit and welfare cuts have undermined the capacity of benefits to loosen the grip of poverty. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that this dismantling, which for instance turns tax credits from an entitlement into a benefit now subject to sanction, is pushing families further into in-work poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and I know that the work that the member has done in the committee has been investigating that incredibly uh, real and increasing problem. One of the main factors that influence levels of in-work poverty is social security, and therefore the cuts that will see social security spend reduced by 3.7 billion by in 2020-21 alone will only serve to compound already high levels of in-work poverty. Uh, in Scotland, two-thirds of children in Poverty come from how homes where an individual works and one third come from homes where an adult works full time and that is unacceptable. That signals families working damn hard and never getting out of the bit and that's something that we need to turn around. Other factors are hours and hourly pay which isn't keeping pace with the cost of living. Uh, but there is no doubt that with the powers over social security employment at least devolved to this parliament we would be able to take a much more action to pull people out of poverty. And we're already though with the powers that we, we have making sure that people can uh, benefit from the living wage and Scotland has a, a disproportionately higher number of people in receipt of the living wage across the country. That's using the powers and influence that we have to try and push uh, that improvement forward. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Uh, the rapporteur is clear in terms of the link uh, in, to, uh, in cuts to local government funding and poverty. So can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government's reflection is on this point, given that Scottish Government funding to local authorities has fallen by 7.1% since 1314, uh, whereas uh, funding to the Scottish Government has only fallen by 1.8%. Likewise, the rapporteur raised concerns about the lack of awareness of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Can I ask what the Scottish Government intends to do about that? Cabinet Secretary. Um, in terms of local government, we continue to treat local government fairly with the funding a settlement that is agreed. And certainly I would also point to the fact that alongside that, a, that settlement that we give to local authorities, the £125 million pounds in mitigation that we spend, a, the £3.5 million pounds we're spending on a food, a dignified approaches to food and insecurity, and also the work that Shirley Ann Somerville and her team are doing around the Social Security Agency and that continued engagement that we have in partnership with local government to ensure that we can protect those that are most vulnerable. And in terms of the Scottish Welfare Fund, eh, the, we will do what we can. If there are issues that we can, ways in which we can make improvements, of course we'll look at it. But to date, 306,000 individual households have been helped through that fund. Eh, and of course, we'll continue to do what we can to help even more. Fulton McGregor. 
Thank you, President Officer. The UN Special Rapporteur said in his remarks that he was shocked that the Scottish Government is spending £125 million on welfare mitigation. Well, as the MSP covering Cope Bridge, this is not a shock to me. As referrals to the local food bank and cool school uniforms go through the roof, people are suffering with universal credit and North Lancashire Council implements heavy cuts to key services. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree with me that the Scottish Government, in fact, has to spend much more than this to mop up the damage of UK austerity? And has the Government done an analysis on those figures? Cabinet Secretary. The Member is right to point out again that we are mopping up the uh, mess uh, and consequences of decisions made by another government. And we, of course, will be spending, probably in the way that he has articulated, spending a lot more to mitigate the worst impacts of UK austerity. For example, the council tax reduction scheme and increased funding to support employment programmes. And we're certainly actively considering and conducting analysis that brings that together and continue to work with the member and let him know and alert him uh, as when we continue to make progress on that. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary and members. That concludes our statement.